hydrogen. The performance of these engines is improving all the time. Not surprising for a car running on rocket fuel. Early problems with running cars on a highly flammable gas that must be stored under high pressure have gradually been solved. Refueling looks a little complicated, but it's now almost as simple as pumping gas. And the advantage of cars burning hydrogen is that all that comes out of the exhaust is water. But in essence, this hasn't really moved us on much from the Stone Age. It's still just setting fire to stuff. Where hydrogen really scores is when it's used to power a fuel cell. In a fuel cell, hydrogen is fused to oxygen in such a way as to produce a flow of electricity. And the electricity can then be used to run the advanced engine of this car. Like the combustion engine, the exhaust is still just water. But while the internal combustion engine is only around 20% efficient, the hydrogen fuel cell runs at 80% efficiency. Already, scientists are developing hydrogen fuel cells small enough to replace the ordinary batteries in a laptop. In theory, there's no reason that, in the future, we couldn't have hydrogen power stations to produce all our electricity, ultimately powered by the sun. The biggest problem with hydrogen fuel is that, at the moment, most of it comes from breaking down fossil fuels. It's the hydro part of hydrocarbon. This produces as much damaging greenhouse gas as does burning the hydrocarbon in the first place. But there's a vast source of hydrogen that bio-inspired thinking, like artificial leaves, could unlock without any pollution at all. Water. Using only the power of sunlight, we could extract all the fuel we need from pure, clean water. And when we use that fuel, either by burning it or in a fuel cell, we simply produce more water, the ultimate in recycling. But while we wait for a new future of limitless clean energy, there are other lessons we can learn from nature, such as using the energy we already have as efficiently as possible. Termites are nature's master builders. They use mud mixed with saliva to build huge castles of clay. Inside these fortresses, the termites rear their young, and in some cases, even grow their own crops. These structures are not just mounds of earth, they're highly sophisticated buildings. A termite colony uses as much oxygen and produces as much carbon dioxide as a cow, and they create a lot of heat. Yet they live sealed inside their mounds, so they must be somehow ventilating their buildings. Engineers from Loughborough University in the UK and biologists from the State University of New York have teamed up to find out what the termites are up to. Many of these mounds in Namibia have been modified to allow the scientists to monitor what the termites are doing. Recording the temperature inside the nest, the scientists found that it stayed constant throughout the day. They also found that the termites can control carbon dioxide levels and humidity, as well as temperature. They seem to be living in a perfect air-conditioned building. To find out how they do this, 
the scientists fitted observation windows into the mounds so they could video the termites over long periods of time. They found that if they injected carbon dioxide into the nest, the termites changed their pattern of building, constructing subtly different patterns of tunnels through the nest. It looks like the secret of the termites' amazing air conditioning lies in the fine details of their nest construction. And that means, somehow, trying to map an entire nest down to its smallest tunnels, something no one had done before. For one thing, the outer walls of the mound are like concrete, but that's not something to put off an engineer. They plan to use a JCB as a precision tool to slice a nest in half to look at the basic structure. It was a big job. The tower can reach up to three meters, but the nest also extends several meters below ground. This is where most of the termites live and where they cultivate their gardens of white fungus the only thing they eat. Above the underground living quarters, most of the top half of the mound is a network of empty tunnels. There's one large chimney running up the center of the tower. And surrounding this, a complex network of smaller tunnels feeds into the main chimney. But these tunnels also branch and twist to end up running just beneath the outer surface of the mound. But this way of dissecting the mound was too crude to see the finer details of the termites' construction techniques. So the engineers came up with a new idea to inject a nest with a gypsum mixture that fills all the tunnels and sets hard. It's a tricky business. The mixture had to be just the right consistency to flow into all the tunnels and not set until it had filled the entire nest. Not surprisingly, no one had ever tried this before. The crew excavated the base of the nest, then covered the whole mound in a protective layer of gypsum. Then they could start pouring the mixture. Somehow, they had to work out when the nest was full. Then they had to wait until they were sure the gypsum had set hard. All that remained was to reveal the inner structure of the nest by blasting the mud away with a high pressure hose, hopefully leaving the complex tunnel system outlined in gypsum intact. It worked. 
the scientists were left with a beautiful, intricate, termite-carved sculpture, showing just how complex these mounds of mud really are. But they're still not satisfied. This technique reveals how all the large tunnels link together, but it destroyed a layer of finer tunnels that the scientists had noticed in the JCB excavations. So they came up with an extraordinary way of visualizing the mound, right down to its finest details. They built the world's largest flatbed scanner over a mound that had been injected with gypsum. The idea was to shave a thin layer off the top of the nest and to photograph it. The white, gypsum-filled tunnels clearly stand out. Then, over the next two weeks, working day and night, the mound was shaved away millimetre by millimetre, taking photographs all the way. The scientists then loaded the long sequence of photographs into a computer, and using software designed to piece together similar slices from an MRI scan, they could build up a composite picture of the nest. Finally, this model could be fed into a 3D animation computer to produce something no one has ever seen before. An exact replica of a termite mound that we can fly through to see exactly how the termites have made it. Based on this, the scientists could work out that the air conditioning system is driven by the wind. The complex network of tunnels damps out variations in wind speed and strength, producing a steady circulation of air through the nest chamber and gardens and up into the central funnel. If the circulating air current is not strong enough, the termites extend the mound higher and build more tunnels to compensate. Analyzing the details of such computer models is suggesting new ways of building energy-efficient buildings. That, like the termites' mounds, can be air-conditioned by the wind. But we can only think about such new and complex designs because over the last few decades, our society has been transformed by the power of computing. The information revolution has touched all our lives in countless ways. At the touch of a few keys, we can access vast quantities of information instantaneously and from anywhere in the world without ever leaving our homes. Nature has also had its own information revolution. The evolution of complex life forms brought the need for more sophisticated ways to sense the environment, to find food, mates, or shelter, or to detect danger. A cockroach is bristling with high-tech sensor arrays for touch, sight, scent, taste. It can even detect the slightest movement of air. The two tails of a roach are called cirque, and they're covered in hairs that respond to tiny air movements. Many other insects have similar air current detectors, and it's such a sensitive system that scientists at Reading University in the UK are trying to unpick its details by recording how insects respond to the smallest breath of wind. These tiny air currents are produced in a precisely controlled way from a speaker producing very low-frequency sound. Each individual hair is mounted in a socket that only allows it to bend in one direction. But by having hundreds of hairs, each orientated in a different direction, the insect can pinpoint exactly where the air current is coming from. 
as well as what size